So the tail of the ox and the donkey. The um, Sherazad is curious about this. She immediately perks in and says, oh, really? Tell me about that story. What, what happens? Uh, little, little detail of human nature. Her father says, well, okay, and I'm going to tell you this story, and then it'll make sense. You will believe me, and then you will not want to go and pursue this crazy plan that's going to end up with you uh, getting killed. And he tells her this story about this, uh, this merchant who has a farm, and for some reason he has the power to understand what animals say. Uh, and if, if he tells anybody about this power, if he talks about it in any way, he will die. That is the, that's the deal. You can understand what animals say, but if you say anything to anybody, you will die. And he overhears the, uh, his ox and his donkey strike up a conversation. And the ox complains one day about how the donkey gets kind of a cushy life, how he just has to go out and, you know, ride the, uh, the merchant into town every now and then. And, but the ox, he's, he's out there working on the farm and he's pulling a plow through, uh, through the fields and he gets, uh, he, he doesn't like the food he's given and he's just griping. Fairly familiar complaint of, uh, labor. And the donkey says, well, Hmm. Yeah, what you should do is go and pretend to be sick or just stop working and just sit down and refuse to do anything and see how that goes. And he, uh, his motives in saying this seem a little bit uh, suspicious. And the advice itself is not necessarily all that good. And uh, he seems to be setting up the ox, honestly, for punishment. Um, either way, it, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, advice that is proffered as constructive or helpful or in any way good-hearted. Uh, but the ox takes him up, up on it, and he sits down, and he doesn't do anything, and uh, the merchant gets irritated with this, and he beats him a couple of times, but then just drags him back to the barn, and then the next day, he pulls out, and he makes the donkey do all of the ox's work. And the donkey doesn't want to do this, so what's, uh, what's the problem? And uh, ultimately, the... Um, it's a story about um, uh, selfishness punished or deviousness or cunning uh, punished the donkey was trying to be a little sneaky and maybe set up the ox and he gets punished for that but the when uh, when the vizier is conveying this story, trying to make this point to his daughter, the point he actually makes and that he interprets the story is all this happened to me because of my calculation. He's putting these words in the, uh, the mouth of the donkey. All of these happened to me because of my miscalculation. I would be sitting pretty but for my curiosity. If I don't find a way to return this ox to his former situation, I will uh, I will perish. And then the vizier says, you, my daughter, will likewise perish because of your miscalculation. He is couching it in the same terms, or he's interpreting it in a certain way about a punishment for curiosity. And of course, curiosity is exactly what this whole work is functioning on, because it was curiosity that got... Shahrazad to say, really tell me the story. It was curiosity that leads to the entire thing. Every cliffhanger, every cliffhanger, every cliffhanger is about curiosity. And <sighs> the vizier is saying that he is misinterpreting this story as a punishment or a danger the danger of curiosity. Curiosity needs to be avoided. Curiosity is bad. And he is misinterpreting the story. And this is kind of
kind of important because he's using the story to make a point. He's using the story to um, teach a lesson. He's using the story to drive a specific message, but he is missing he is misunderstanding the basic the basic nature of the story and so the message gets muddled it's like telephone honestly people will tell different stories different ways because these are all handed down and they're all going to get reinterpreted a dozen different ways and he is reinterpreting the story for a specific purpose but it's out of his control he cannot control it and so he misinterprets it um, but then he tells another story to, uh, continue because he said, don't do, or she says, father, I must go to the king and you must give me to him. He said, don't do it. She insisted. I must. He replied, if you don't desist, I will do what you, I will do to you what the merchant did to his wife. Setting it up again, just teeing that up and yeah, she's going to bite. She asked, Father, what did the merchant do to his wife? Uh, come on. Um, and we get another little story of that same merchant and his wife and the talking animals. And here, uh, the wife over or notices that her husband is sort of chuckling at what he is hearing from the animals and she just hears animal sounds so she doesn't know and she starts to get indignant saying well what what's so funny and uh she is very curious what are you laughing at are you making fun of me right down at the bottom of page 609 he said no she said tell me what made you laugh curiosity she is curious he replied, I cannot tell you. I'm afraid to disclose the secret conversation of the animal. She asked, and what prevents you from telling me? He answered, the fear of death. His wife said, by God, you are lying. This is nothing but an excuse. I swear by God, the Lord of heaven, that if you don't tell me and explain the cause of your laughter, I will leave you. You must tell me. Now, he had just told her that I will die if I tell you. She is blowing right past that and saying, tell me, um, which is a very intemperate and I would say uh, remarkably insensitive or cruel remark. It is not showing a basic compassion for her husband, who she's supposed to care about and not want to die. Uh, but specifically, you also see, because it's very noticeable within this tight little sentence here, she said, she starts off by, uh, by saying, or his wife said, by God, you are lying. By God. Hmm. This is nothing but an excuse. I swear by God. Twice. Really close in the sentence. The Lord of heaven. Really driving it home. This is uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. This is blasphemy of a sort. This is swearing, literally. And this is a no-no within the moral structure of this work, within the broader moral structure of the Judeo-Christian uh, and here Islamic effort, um, taking the Lord's name in vain. And so she is already by that signaling that she is not a, um, mm, a pious person, perhaps. Uh, she does not have the submissive qualities that is, that are heralded in the Islamic faith. So Islam, of course, means submission. Um, the merchant said, damn it, why, tell me why you are crying. Ask for God's forgiveness. Here he is signaling that he is pious. No, submit to God. Ask for good uh, forgiveness and stop questioning me and leave me in peace. She said, I insist and will not desist. And she's becoming very rigid on this. This is no longer even just curiosity. This is just, I need to know. She doesn't seem all that concerned necessarily about, because she doesn't mention it, about the actual content that she's asking, uh, 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 that, that she's asking about. She doesn't seem so much irritated by that. It's just the fact that he's not telling her. She is outraged by um, this lack of consideration. Again, somewhat ego-driven. Um, 
amazed at her, he replied, you insist? If I tell you what the donkey said to the ox, which made me laugh, I shall die. She said, yes, I insist, even if you have to die, which is harsh. But he accepts those terms, said, okay, fine, I'll die. And then you get this curious little back end of this paragraph, right in the middle of page 610, where he says, he summoned legal witnesses, wrote a will, leaving his wife and children their due portions, freed his slave girls, slave, his slave girls, and bid his family goodbye, while everyone, even the witnesses, wept. Then the wife's parents approached her and said, desist, for, for if your husband had not known for certain that he would die if he revealed his secret, he wouldn't have gone through all this. She replied, I will not change my mind, and everybody cried and prepared to mourn his death. A lot going on here. She is holding to this tough line. Other people are coming to her, which indicates a community, and some people are in that community are quite concerned that the merchant is going to die. But also that curious little thing that, you know, there's a, why do we care that he's setting up, that he's making these arrangements for his death? It seems sort of out of place, a little bit mundane almost. Um, he's, att he's attending to paperwork. That doesn't really make a lot of sense in a story. But if you read the Quran, you find a surprising uh, proportion of it dedicated to exactly this, to uh, probate, to people dividing up their property for after they die. And this is, uh, the Quran is a fascinating text for uh, many reasons, but one of them is just for the way it's uh, trying to reduce stress and tensions within a tight tribal community and war over, you know, when somebody dies, people get very uh, embittered over dividing up their stuff. So that's a curious little subheading in there. Um, the... Um, they divide up all the property and there uh it happened that the merchant kept 50 hens and a rooster at home and there was a little bit of a comic scene where the uh the rooster uh, gets scolded by uh um by a dog because the rooster keeps hopping on the chickens it's what roosters do um and uh, the dog is um, concerned about this, the propriety of it. You know, you, our master is going to go die, and you're just humping everything you can find. And uh, he, he was quite you know, miffed about this. And then the... Um... <laughs> The, uh, the, the, the advice that the, uh, 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 that the rooster gives for, uh, um, for, for the master, what the master should do it for the merchant is, uh, the rooster replied, he should take an oak branch push her into a room, lock the door, and fall on her with a stick, beating her mercilessly until he breaks her arms and legs and she cries out, I no longer want you to tell me or explain anything. Which is horrifying. Uh, he wants her to beat her mercilessly. And um, it, 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 it almost seems, I mean, first push her into a room uh, and, and lock the door. That's kind of disturbing already. That has a like almost uh, rape qual uh, quality to it. But then just the vicious beating. This, uh, this is government by force that the rooster is advocating to the, uh, to the merchant and he does it. And it, it, the terms of it are really quite stark. And, and and this is disturbing. It's not the cute little story that about talking animals anymore. This is something really quite horrifying. The 
the vizier is telling this story to try and convince his daughter that this should be a um that this is an example of impiety punished of the lack of submission punishable but again it seems like an unreliable uh interpretation because it's being she's being punished for uh for her impiety of curiosity once again she wants the wife wants to know what is happening it's not just that she isn't submitting to her husband it's that she's not submitting to him but she's also being curious and here it seems like a very unreliable interpretation to just say well no let's just focus on you know she's not submitting properly and well there's that curiosity thing again and he is for two stories in a row i would say largely misinterpreting this story and trying to use it to make one point when actually it's kind of making another and this instability runs throughout and again right at the beginning of these massive books it's driving home the uh the point that stories can be dynamic and uncertain and you have very little control over what they actual actually mean and this needs to be understood in the act of telling a story because stories stories are very human they they draw on our most elemental curiosities and need to come together but at the same time they're very unstable and they can mean so many different things that we don't always fully understand and somebody like the vizier who again isn't the brightest guy in the world he doesn't quite understand now this whole time Shahrazad is sitting there listening to these stories really and you know you're these stories have a message yeah but maybe you know my dad is just kind of too much of a dope to fully understand them but what if somebody understood the power of stories understood how to make a point with stories and understood how stories can bring people together instead of just driving them apart Shahrazad is much smarter than her father Shahrazad will draw this lesson from the stories her father tells and the way he tells them she will draw her own lesson to say well all right stories can do things and in the hands of a master storyteller they can do quite a lot so she's going to use this to her advantage she gets her father to introduce her to uh, Shariar, and uh, she's a pretty girl. Shariar says, okay, good. Let's get married. Come on upstairs. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow morning, I'll kill you. Um, this was her plan. And when they go upstairs to his room and uh, Shariar took her to bed and began to fondle her. She wept. And when he asked her, why are you crying? Curiosity. She replied, I have a sister and I wish to bid her goodbye before daybreak. Then the king went, went for the, then the king sent for the sister who came and went to sleep under the bed. When the night wore on, she woke up and waited until the king had satisfied himself with her sister which again is sort of a queasy representation of sexuality and it's a little uncomfortable with the sister but in a largely bedouin society people were you know there's very little privacy in rooms anyway um but it's unseemly Shahrazad and and they were now fully awake then Dinarzad the sister cleared her throat and said sister if you are not sleepy tell us one of your little tales to while away the night before I bid you goodbye at daybreak for I don't know what I will want to happen before tomorrow 
or I don't know what will happen to you tomorrow. Shahrazad turned to King Shariar and said, May I have your permission to tell a story? Very polite, very submissive. Dinarzad asked Shahrazad, uh, Shahrazad asked Shariar, Shah, asked Shariar, showing submission, showing propriety. And he replied, yes. And Shahrazad was very happy and said, listen. And here she starts to tell story.